want to welcome everybody to our ninth annual fall symposium. I'm delighted to be with you today. It's been an amazing year so far for ADDF, and we're hitting some really terrific milestones. 20 years ago, the organization was founded by Ronald and Lennon Lauder, driven by the passion and perseverance to close in on cures and treatments for dementia and Alzheimer's. This year, we were thrilled to announce with Bill Gates, the Dolby family, and the Charles and Helen Schwab Foundation the creation of the Diagnostics Accelerator, a new initiative that advances the development of no novel biomarkers. Dr. Fillett and our expert panel will be explaining biomarkers to you all a little, in a couple of minutes. We are also thankful to each and every one of you for your continued support. You will hear later in the luncheon today about yet another record setting year on the fundraising side, but most importantly this morning you're going to hear about the exciting science. Together, we can reach our shared goal to accelerate the development of drugs for the prevention and the treatment of Alzheimer's. None of us would be here today in this room sitting here taking in all the knowledge and how exciting the development of potential treatments are if it were not for the vision and the philanthropy of the Lauder family. We are grateful to that vision and leadership, and it is now my honor to introduce to you our co-founder and co-chairman, Mr. Ronald Lauder. Well, good morning, and thank you, Mark, for your very kind words. It's my pleasure also to welcome all of you here today to our fall symposium. When Leonard and I started ADDF in 1998, 20 years ago, there was zero hope for Alzheimer's patients. If you were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it was worse than a death sentence because you lost the two most precious gifts that human beings have, reason and memory. At times, it's good to forget memory. <laughs> and what's terrible for anyone with Alzheimer's, it's even worse for their loved ones. Leonard and I wanted to change all of that. Today, I can tell you there is hope. The tide is turning, and you'll hear about it in a panel discussion coming up. That, home, that hope comes directly from the work that the ADDF is doing, in particular on our focus, as you just heard, of biomarker projects. In today's symposium, which goes by a catchy name, and anyone that can remember it, Biomarkers to Accelerate Drug Development for Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, it's, a, it's a name that's very catchy. You'll really, people will stop you in the street and ask you about it. Um, you will learn more about the role of biomarkers in, in the early detection of accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Monitoring disease progression and advancing clinical trials is what we're here about today. The development of biomarkers is an area of research that the ADS, ADDF has always funded and prompted and promoted the speed up and for the development of drugs for Alzheimer's. We have provided seed funding that led to the AmiVid PET scan. That's the first diagnostic test for Alzheimer's approved by the FDA. But only a small percentage of patients in the U.S. have been tested with these biomarkers because they are too expensive and they are not readily available. Unlike cancer and heart disease, we just don't have the tools right now to easily and inexpensively diagnose Alzheimer's. And that is what ADF is trying to change. That's why we created the Diagnostic Accelerator, a new approach that brings together our philanthropic capital with a venture mindset to advance bold new ideas. This is a, this is a special name that we call Venture phil Philanthropy. Most of my best investments become philanthropy. <laughs> and good tax shelters. 
<laughs> um, these philanthropy is really changing our lives for the better, and they're fast-tracking better tests, tests that can revolutionize how we approach Alzheimer's. I can't even tell you the huge impact they will have on patients and their caregivers. And I realize that includes many of you in this room. We're also learning more about what we can do to prevent Alzheimer's. You'll hear scientific, scientific evidence today that shows how we can protect our brains as we age and reduce our risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. We are, we are at an exciting time in our research program, and this I believe. We could not get to this pivotal point without the support of everyone in this room. And we couldn't get to this point without the leadership of our founding executive director and chief scientific officer, Dr. Howard Phillips. <laughs> Dr. Phillips will be leading our panel discussion in a few minutes. After the symposium, please join us for lunch. This year, we are hon honoring David Weinrib, uh, executive, the chief executive officer of the Howard Hughes Corporation for his leadership and outstanding support. Uh, thank you all, and, and now for the panel discussion. I will be leaving for a second, I'll be back at lunch. I have another job, which is after Pittsburgh, what do we do? Which is also very tough. Um, now I will ask Howard Phil to please come up. Oh. I'm not Howard Phillips, but I'm this is Howard Phillips' younger brother. <laughs> I'll take that any time. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you. Thank you. Before my older brother, Dr. Howard Phillips, comes up and, and introduces you to the panelists, I have the uh, uh, distinct pleasure of introducing you to Phyllis Farrell, who's the Vice President of Global Alzheimer's Disease Platform at the uh, Eli Lilly Biomedicines. Uh, first, I want to have a big thank you for Eli Lilly, who's sponsoring this uh, terrific educational symposium today. They uh, sponsor us here. They sponsor us in Washington, D.C. We're very grateful to Eli Lilly. <laughs> Phyllis and her team are responsible for late-stage development and global registration of solanazumab, solanazumab <laughs> I did that, Amavid and AZD, 3293, and this includes the, their global launches and commercialization. The team is also planning for several other early stage assets targeted at patients and supporting their caregivers. Um, I want to add a couple of other words here, um, and it relates to looking up words in the dictionary. Uh, if you look up the term leader, there is a picture of Phyllis. There isn't a, a conference related to dementia or Alzheimer's anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world that she is not there and not only pushing the agenda forward, but quite frankly, leading the agenda. And if you look up the uh, definition of partner in the dictionary, you will see Eli Lilly. They are a true partner in drug development with the ADDF. We are gra very grateful. Phyllis, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Mark and Howard and Lauren and the whole team uh, for allowing us to attend such a great event. Um, there is a very, very long history of partnership between Lilly and ADDF. And um, one of my favorite things to, to say is it actually started um, even before Lilly, when uh, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals was a standalone organization. And ADDF believed in Alzheimer's diagnostics when no one else did. And it was thanks to that seed funding that we have the single greatest innovation that has happened in, Al in Alzheimer's disease research in over a decade. Uh, and that is Amavid, the, uh, the investigational drug that Mr. Lauder mentioned. I'm sorry, the imaging drug that Mr. Lauder mentioned. Um, and it is um, a truly remarkable agent that is allowing us to do research that was never before possible. And having a lot of individuals who've spent some time at the commercial interface as well, it's changing patients' lives. Uh, individuals might receive an Alzheimer's diagnosis and then uh, have, be ready to sell off assets, be ready to quit their job, um, 
you know, potentially uh, other devastating thoughts, and an Amavid scan will tell them that actually the plaque that is associated with the pathology of the disease is not actually there. And they have a new lease on life to go find out what's actually causing the symptoms that are obviously bothersome to them and their families. Uh, the tools allowing us to do research in patients very, very early, prior to even symptoms coming around. And so we didn't have the opportunity to do that, um, and we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that without ADDF seed funding. Lily was very, very pleased uh, with the acquisition of Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals to bring that into our suite of Alzheimer's research. Lily's been in Alzheimer's research for over 30 years. Um, that partnership uh, with ADDF is 20 years long. And in addition to doing diagnostic work together, we also do research in neuroinflammation together, uh, other modalities, um, other ways to bring drugs from bench to patient much more quickly. But we also work together outside of the research arena. And um, Mr. Lauder mentioned this as well, that patients aren't actually getting the care they need in today's healthcare system. And if some of you live with Alzheimer's disease in your family, I have, you know this is true. And so Howard and I sit together on a committee with the Duke Margolis Policy Institute to figure out what do we need to do in our US healthcare system to make sure that patients get the care that they need today and have access to the innovative therapies when they become available. And so we're very, very excited about the diagnostic accelerator. We think that's one of the things that'll help move patients through the system in a very, very healthy way. Our partnership with ADDF is aligned on our values, two main things. We put patients and science first in absolutely everything we do at Eli Lilly and Company, and so does the ADDF, and it's one of the reasons that we've had such a long and healthy partnership. So I'd just like to uh, close with congratulating the honoree, Mr. Weinreb, um, thanking Leonard and Ronald Lauder and their family for having the vision 20 years ago to start this organization, and thanking Howard for guiding ADDF with uh, scientific integrity. So thank you very much. Okay, and without further ado, I would like my older brother, <laughs> the founding uh, executive De director, the brilliant chief science officer, and, and my absolute partner in all that ADDF does to come up, Dr. Howard Fillett. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's a, it's a great honor to be here with you and have this symposium to update you on our prog progress and to introduce you to the scientists who will be speaking today. Uh, two of our experts, Dr. Mark Minton and Dr. Michelle Milkey, uh, will discuss their work in developing biomarkers and discuss what the future holds in, in, the, in this area of biomarkers. And Dr. Richard Isaacson at Cornell um, is an expert in prevention and will talk about how biomarkers play a role in prevention and update you on really what's really exciting news in the field of prevention, <coughs> excuse me, of Alzheimer's. Um, and I'll be moderating the discussion. Just a few comments before we get started. Um, I saw my first patient with Alzheimer's disease around 1979, which was about 40 years ago. And as was mentioned at that time, we literally knew nothing about Alzheimer's disease. Um, at the time, I'm not sure what I was diagnosing, who I was diagnosing. There was very little known about how to care for these people, and there were certainly no drugs on the market. The first drugs came to the market in the mid-1990s, which was almost 20 years after I started seeing patients. So that's my perspective, uh, the time of professional lifetime of, uh, in which we've gone from nothing to where we are today. It is just, to me, amazing and exciting. I'm just, I would almost get emotional about it. Um, I've never been as op optimistic that we're gonna have breakthroughs, uh, breakthroughs in, the, in, the coming year, in the coming years, meaning like three to five years, if not sooner. Um, we have a much better understanding of the science behind Alzheimer's disease, and from that we can identify targets for drugs and biomarkers. So the science has had 30, 35 years to mature. Uh, one study once showed that it takes about 30 to 35 years to go from a discovery to a new, new drug. Cholesterol was discovered in the 1950s as a biomarker for heart disease, and the first drugs for um, heart disease really didn't come to market until 35 years later when the statins were brought. So that's a pretty good metric. Um, you, you heard that Eli Lilly's been in this 25 years, and I think we're on the verge of moving forward from Eli Lilly, and they've put tr tremendous amount of money. I mean, I think I can fairly say billions of dollars into research on Alzheimer's, particularly the late stage phase three programs. Um, 
and, and so now we have biomarkers, and this is not only, as was mentioned, going to help us diagnose people in the, in the clinic, and the Amovid scan I use in so many of my patients. Unfor unfortunately, most patients do not have access to the scan because of the cost right now, and that's a whole other societal issue that we could discuss as far as why Medic, even though FDA approved the test, Medicare will not pay for it. And this is a, a symptom of our, of our modern healthcare system that um, we're going to find a lot more cost effectiveness type of research. So we pull all the science in over decades. We get it approved by the FDA, but then we got to get it paid for by Medicare. And we have to prove that these things are worthwhile. Um, and we've made a, a, a tremendous uh, advances. ADDF right now is, is spending about $36 million on over 30 clinical trials. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about these later during the luncheon. Um, as was mentioned, the biomarkers help with early diagnosis, but they help us to accelerate developing new drugs. They help us to make sure that the people that get into trials have Alzheimer's disease, and they can be used in monitoring the research on the progress of therapy. And um, Mark will talk about that later. So with that sort of general background, I'd like to introduce Dr. Minton, my colleague from Lilly. Dr. Minton is the Vice President of Pain and Neurodegeneration at Eli Lilly, and he's led the clinical development programs for imaging and tau pathology at Alzheimer's, uh, for Alzheimer's disease while at AVID, and um, AVID, of course, developed floor beta peers. So please welcome me in, uh, in, in, in greeting uh, Mark <laughs> Minton today as our first speaker. Thank you. And so go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, imaging biomarkers, so ways of imaging tau and amyloid in the human brain, in the living human brain. Um, and why would we want to do that? And the most obvious reasons is that if, if you look under a microscope, the definition of Alzheimer's disease is amyloid plaques and tau tangles. So amyloid and tau are just actual proteins that in a healthy brain are doing their own thing, they're not causing trouble. But in Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid seems to clump and start being, um, and, and start spreading as a clump throughout the brain, and then it seems to trigger tau, which is a protein that has a normal function, but then it starts clumping inside the neurons and looks like it's associated with the death, ultimate death of those neurons. So those two things, amyloid and tau, people have been studying for a long time, but you couldn't really look at them until someone died and you looked at it under a microscope. Really made it difficult. This. And so um, I, I started getting into this when I was at Washington University, like almost two decades ago. Um, but it was just about 10 years ago I realized there was this audacious company that had this idea to take some of the things like people like me were doing in a laboratory about trying to image these amyloid plaques and take them, develop them, validate them, and get them out into the clinic, from laboratory to clinic. And people did not think that was going to work. And in, now, of course, not everybody didn't think there was going to work. A key person over here to my right, and the ADDF actually was behind that. They were helping out. Um, I joined the company about eight years ago, and we basically developed that and were able to validate that against autopsy. So we had something that now could serve as a way of imaging. It's a, it's a molecule that sticks to amyloid plaque that you tag, um, and that tag can be seen by a PET scanner. So you could actually see the amyloid in the brain via this tag. Um, once that was approved and we started getting data, we realized things like we had research trials across Alzheimer's research of which the amyloid scan was now showing that maybe 20, 30 percent of those people weren't, didn't have amyloid, they didn't have the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. This was a real shock and so now we started thinking we needed to make sure people had the diagnosis biochemically, not just clinically. Um, another thing that turns out is you started noticing that amyloid started appearing far b before symptoms. And now that sounds horrible that something's going on silently in the brain, but that also gave us could we operate in that window of opportunity to stop before the brain starts losing neurons. Um, so that started going forward, and, and, and Phyllis and, and Howard mentioned a few things, um, and, that, and that continues to sort of spread throughout the world as, a, as an opportunity, both for patients but also for research. But we turned our attention to now tau. Remember I said there were two proteins, one that seems to be the preceding, the trigger, and the second one being the actual thing that seems to be associated with the actual death of neurons. And so we turned to this tau protein imaging, and in the last five years, we've come a tremendous distance on that because we started by coming up with this tracer that could stick to the tau um, proteins in the living brain, pick it up on a PET scan, 
Um, and we started figuring out what it could do. And we realized right away that this was a fascinating tool because we could start watching. We could see over a period of years the tau accumulating. We could watch the disease progress. We could see it go from one area of the brain to another area of the brain. And in fact, we could correlate that if it went into one area of the brain, that area of the brain responsible for certain functions, it was associated with a loss of that function. So we started seeing the connection between the pathology and the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, just recently, we were able to um, um, complete a phase three study in demonstrating that our tau tracer really does predict the, the presence of high pathology of tau on Alzheimer's patients. So we feel very convinced that these symptoms that we've been seeing um, correlating to these um, signs of this biomarker and imaging were truly connected and were real. Um, this it makes a lot of new things, which is when we looked at some of our research trials, just as we did with amyloid, we were wondering whether some people would have no tau and other people would have a lot of tau. We were shocked, actually, we did not see this coming, that when we think we've screened for a certain type of patient at a certain stage of disease, and then we look at their tau scan, we find a big spectrum. We find some people with very, very early disease that just happen to have a lot of symptoms. We find other people whose brains seem to be compensating. They have very few symptoms for the amount of tau they have, but their disease has actually spread quite a bit. This is actually really interesting because it gives us a new way of thinking about doing research trials, and we're already incorporating that at Eli Lilly in our new trials. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we were able to connect more firmly the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease with where the tau was. So this, this progress in imaging biomarkers, it, I think, has given me a lot of hope. And, and one of the things that people sort of ask me is, connect the dots for me here. Why does a diagnostic test mean anything about therapy? Um, you know, having hope in Alzheimer's sounds hard because of so many disappointments. And, and I would like people to do a thought experiment and sort of like, let's say um, we were trying to do oncology research. And you know, cancer research is just amazing how we get new advances all the time and new people, new types of diseases seem to be able to be treated when they didn't before. But let's say in cancer research, we couldn't know whether someone actually had cancer. We had to guess whether they had cancer. We didn't have a biopsy that looked at the, mo the, the molecular cells and said, yep, this is cancer. That would make it really hard to do a cancer trial. Um, let's say in cancer, that when you enrolled somebody in a cancer trial, you didn't know whether they had stage one disease where it was all isolated and you made it, maybe just surgery would treat it versus metastatic disease where it would almost certainly require a different type of treatment. Let's say you couldn't tell the difference between an advanced patient and an early patient. Um, and then let's say we didn't have all these great imaging techniques to say, you know, I know you've had a month of chemotherapy and I know you feel miserable, but look at the scan. The scan shows that your tumors have shrunk. Some of them may have disappeared. Wouldn't, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be horrible to find out that we couldn't tell when we have pro drugs that work because we couldn't measure what they're doing to the, to the actual pathology? The sad thing about it is that all of those things were true of Alzheimer's disease just 10 years ago. We had none of those things. We didn't have ways of actually knowing them, whether someone had Alzheimer's disease. And then we, and we have amyloid scans to be able to say, yes, you have the pathology. We didn't have ways of knowing the underlying amount of disease they had. So we couldn't stage them really well. And now we're getting the, the techniques to do that. And, so, and now we have both amyloid and tau imaging, which give us quantitative numbers that if we're reversing that pathology, if we're taking away the amyloid, like some of our new drugs are showing, um, we can have hope that we're on the right track. If we are stopping that tau from progressing and moving into new areas of the brain, we have hope that that drug is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and that's why I think we're well positioned to take advantage of these things. Now, admittedly, there's problems with access. There is issues of expense. I think we're going to have some other thoughts here about how we can go forward. We're not done coming up with good ways of, of diagnosing and staging and monitoring Alzheimer's disease. But I think now we have that platform to build on and that's really why you know, I come to work every day. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So maybe, maybe just one or two questions for you. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, just a comment on, on cancer. You know, Albert Lasker Jr. started a cancer foundation in the 1920s um, because his wife died of it. And um, the NIH, when it was founded in 1948, was right. very much a cancer institute yep, that yep. was started by Mary Lasker, who was Albert Lasker's second wife. 
And so my point is that, uh, as I mentioned, there's 30, 35 year gap between a discovery and the development of a drug. The reason cancer is so far ahead, one of the reasons is, we've been doing cancer research for 100 years. Yep. Uh, you know, back in 30, 35 years ago, we didn't know anything about it. And, and, and as you mentioned, biomarkers just really revolutionized it. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit, because a lot of patients, a lot of people in the audience, probably their loved ones go for MRIs. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about how, how MRIs play into our research, you know, volumetric yeah, studies absolutely. and diagnosis and that kind of thing? Yep, absolutely. Um, MRIs serve several purposes. Of course, that's a, that's a very advanced, high-resolution way of looking at the brain and the brain structure. Um, in, at, a, in a, at a clinical level, one of the most important things of MRIs when someone has problems with memory and, and may, or maybe dementia is to make sure there's not a, a cause such as a brain tumor or a specific stroke or other aspects that would be treated completely differently than Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in the absence of those things, before we had any other biomarkers, we often had to say, well, we've ruled everything else out. It looks like it might be Alzheimer's disease. Um, but they also provide a really interesting aspect of, um, of what goes on in, in research studies, because as those MRIs, um, if you're doing them sequentially in patients in a trial, you can actually see um, the shrinkage of the brain. Now, the shrinkage of the brain can come from a lot of things, and sometimes it can mislead you because it's, it's sort of nonspecific. You know, as you think about it, you, know, you, can, you can lose weight, but you could lose weight for a lot of different reasons. You might be sick and losing weight, or you might be trying to lose weight. And the brain can have different ways of shrinking a little bit. But most of the time, it's because there are neurons that are dying. And while those amyloid and tau pathology signals are going up on the PET scan, we've actually shown that it's very, very, uh, at the exact same time, neurons are dying and the brain is getting smaller. So we are able to monitor that. Now the MRI, because it tells us so many different things, is sometimes a very good tool as a basket to check all the different things that might be going on in the brain. And so it becomes a very important tool in research to watch how things are, um, wh whether there's anything new going on and also whether the shrinking is, is been slowed down by a drug. So we have disease-specific markers in yes. amyloid and tau. We have markers of neurodegeneration in terms of volume of shrinking. And in Alzheimer patients, the brain shrinks about 4% a year. And in normal people like us, we are only shrinking about 0.4% a year. <laughs> um, one more kind of scan that people might come up against is FDG-PED, which yeah. kind of measures function. Um, could you maybe mention that a bit? Yeah, it, it, FDG-PED is interesting because um, actually the whole reason we have PET scanners around um, around the country is because FDG measures glucose metabolism and tumors have high glucose metabolism. And so it's actually very good to track where tumors are going in the body when you do a whole body scan. In the brain, the brain actually relies very, very heavily on glucose for energy. And so as areas of the brain have increased energy use because they're particularly active, the FDG scan of the brain will light up and show increased. And so it was, many, it was used for research for that purpose for a long time. But in Alzheimer's disease, of course, we're not that lucky. There are areas of the brain that are getting sick and are going down in, in use because they are no longer functioning like they were. And so an FDG scan can show the decreased areas of glucose use or, or sugar use in some areas of the brain. And if that pattern is of the right pattern, it gives a doctor more certainty that this is something that matches an Alzheimer's disease pattern. Now that's sort of pattern matching because there are many things that cause glucose used to go up and down in the brain. Sometimes just being more awake or having your coffee in the morning will actually change. We actually did a study like that, believe it or not, Howard, to show that. So, you know, having your coffee will change the glucose a little bit. Um, but, the, um, but it is a very interesting test and can be very, very useful for a doctor to better understand what's going on in the brain. Well, thank you. I wish we could talk more about yeah. neuroimaging, <laughs> but we're going to move on now to Dr. Michelle Milkey who works as a translational epidemiologist, which is a big word, um, looking at the cause or a set of causes of a disease. And um, Michelle has also worked on, uh, a large focus of her work has been on biomarkers, and we're going to have her speak on um, the development of fluid biomarkers, which means blood tests, basically blood biomarkers. And Michelle's also uh, an expert on gender in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit after. but. Michelle. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much. Um, it, yeah, so as, as Howard mentioned, a uh, main focus of my research is looking at blood-based biomarkers. And as an epidemiologist, I'm interested in trying to find ways to screen and, and to diagnose the general population. 
and the amyloid scans are fantastic. Um, but if some of these promising medications come to fruition, we're going to need to find a way that we can screen the entire population, um, particularly in rural populations, at the general practitioner, where the majority of individuals worried about memory are going to come um, first of all. So it, it's been um, fascinating to be in this field um, within the past few years. Because with the advances of technology, um, we're more able to measure some of these markers in the blood. Um, specifically, amyloid and tau are pathologies in the brain that uh, cause Alzheimer's disease. And now we're looking at some of these measures in the blood. And that is one thing that I do have to say ADDF has supported this. Um, back 10 years ago, even, it was kind of poo-pooed whether you could actually find something in the blood that would be related to the brain. Um, there's the, something called the blood-brain barrier, which, of course, prevents toxins and other things to get into the brain and things from the brain to get into the periphery. And so there's a lot of people thought that a blood test for a brain disorder was absolutely not going to happen. And um, more recently now, there, there is a lot of promise in terms of identifying a blood marker for amyloid. Um, we've also uh, collaborated with Eli Lilly and have a promising blood marker for uh, tau as well that seems to be correlating with um, tau pet in the brain. And uh, another marker that's uh, of interest in this field is uh, neurofilament or a measure of neurodegeneration. So, you know, one way of using a blood marker is to screen individuals to determine who's going to be at risk. And then maybe they go on to have imaging or CSF more invasive measure to really diagnose the disease. So this is kind of similar to, um, say, a mammogram for breast cancer, where everybody's screened with a mammogram. If it's screened positive, you go in and maybe have a biopsy or ultrasound or, or more invasive testing. And that's where we really see uh, the blood markers going. But we also don't have um, great measures in terms of predicting how fast somebody's progressing. Um, obviously, at the population level, we can't do MRIs on everybody every six months to determine how a, a drug is working, whether their atrophy is still at the same rate. And so there's a couple promising markers, one called neurofilament light, or NFL, um, that looks to be a, a global marker of neurodegeneration. And we've just uh, had submitted a paper, too, comparing NFL in the blood versus NFL in the CSF and suggesting that NFL in the blood may be just as good as a marker in the CSF. Um, so I, I think there is hope down the road for not only having a marker of amyloid or tau, the two pathologies, but also having blood markers to um, look at neurodegeneration and uh, rate of cognitive decline. Um, the other thing that I just I also wanted to mention in terms of blood-based biomarkers uh, is looking at other mechanisms. So now that we're starting to understand that, yes, with this new technology, which is much more sensitive, we can measure a lot of things in the blood, um, we're able to look at other mechanisms that contribute to Alzheimer's disease. So for example, um, you know, we know that there are, uh, if you look at people 70 and older, about 30% of individuals who are cognitively unimpaired uh, have amyloid in their brains, but they don't show symptoms. And individuals who uh, at autopsy will have amyloid, uh, or brains filled with amyloid, um, but they were uh, completely cognitively unimpaired when they died. And so um, some of the work that the ADDF has funded um, for us is to try and understand why some individuals who have amyloid in their brains don't develop symptoms. Um, so we've been looking at uh, certain types of lipids in the blood called sphingolipids, uh, neuroinflammation, and, and other markers. Um, to try and understand what some other pathways are that uh, could lead or, or actually protect against Alzheimer's disease. No, thank you, Michelle. Um, you mentioned CSF, that just for interpreting it, there would be a spinal tap. Right, and, sorry. Um, so, um, and, and we do have, I mean, maybe you could comment, but it's the, the spinal fluid analyses are a little few years ahead of the blood tests, but they're used, I guess, in, in clinical trials more, but not so much in, in, in clinical practice. Um, maybe you could comment a little bit about how valuable the spinal fluid tests are to date and, and maybe how well you think they might predict what's going to happen with the biomarkers. You mentioned neurogranin and YKL40. So just like we can separate out in the neuroimaging between function, neurodegeneration, and disease-specific markers, we can kind of do that with spinal fluid, and that's where we, we hope we're going with the blood, I think. so. Right. Right. Um, so I, actually, in Europe, um, cerebral spinal fluid measures of amyloid and tau are, are used for diagnostic purposes. Um, not used really as much in the CSF, 
uh, or sorry, in the United States, just because of the invasiveness of the procedure. And generally, I mean, I know from our population-based studies, if you ask somebody if they'd rather have a lumbar puncture or a, an image a scan, they'd go for the scan. Um, but I, I think it does, it, you know, it shows evidence that we do have good markers in the CSF, uh, amyloid and tau, and there's been a lot of work over the last couple of years in terms of standardizing them and using them as uh, diagnostic markers down the road. Now, the one, it, you know, while a lumbar puncture um, is a little bit more invasive, um, a little bit cheaper to get on the population level, um, one of the, the limitations of it is that you can't look at, I mean, you just have a general measure of amyloid in the brain. And so the, with the scans, you can actually look and see where, they're, where the amyloid is, where the tau is, and that might help influence your diagnosis. Um, but regardless, I, I think there's, uh, with CSF, a lot of promise there um, and potential. And I think there's work at the FDA as well to approve uh, some CSF tests as diagnostic measures for Alzheimer's. Right, so, so people can go for a spinal test now, but um, it's, it's not really standardized the way we would like it. Right. And, and it's, it's kind of hard for practicing physicians to do. It, as you mentioned, there's a, another societal issue about spinal taps these days in the United States in terms of reimbursement and so on. Um, quick question, what, what do you think are the prospects of having a blood test, let's say for amyloid, um, you know, sort of the cholesterol of Alzheimer's disease? What do, you, what do you think the prospects of, of having that blood test approved by the ex FDA in, let's say, two to three or four years, a near-term type of thing? What, what, do, you, what do you think? I, I actually think in, yeah, four or five years, we will have something specifically for amyloid. Um, it, it's really, the, the field is moving extremely fast right now in uh, blood-based and fluid-based biomarkers. And with the last couple of years, a lot of evidence of a few different uh, platforms in terms of measuring amyloid. And we're at the point in terms of trying to figure out what platform might be best for the population, and I think after that you give it a, a year or two and there's the potential for it to be approved. And, and um, I, I mentioned in introducing you that you're also an expert in the role of gender in, in the risk for Alzheimer's, and we know that most people think that, uh, and I think most of the evidence in, uh, points to, that it's not just that women live longer and so they have more prevalence of Alzheimer's, um, but that they're at greater risk and possibly it's because of the menopausal transition. Could you, could you comment on what you think about that? I know there's been some work on that. If you're in favor of that or what do you think, why do you think women are, are at greater risk? Or, and, and how good is the data that women are greater at risk? That's a... Uh, um... I could get up on my soapbox with that. Please do. So, <laughs> yeah. we, I could get you one if you like. <laughs> uh, get more time. Um, it, yeah, so it, you see all over the headlines that uh, women are at greater risk. New York Times, Washington Post, um, whatnot. Um, but a, as an epidemiologist, one of the things I do look at is incidents and risk factors. And it's true that there are more women than men that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And part of that is because they live longer. And so any age-related disease, there's gonna be more women with the disease than there are uh, men with the disease. Uh, but in the United States, with the exception of one study, if you compare a group of women at the age of 80 and a group of men at the age of 80, and you follow them for five years, there is no difference in terms of risk. So women and men, an equal number of women and men uh, would develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, but what is different, it appears, is that there are differences in terms of risk factors. And so one of the things, of course, that has been a primary focus, because when you think of sex differences too, automatically think of hormones, um, is looking at the menopausal transition. And we know now that there are, of course, brain changes over the menopausal transition. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of work with hormone replacement therapy, um, some suggesting that it may be detrimental, some suggesting that it may be protective. Uh, I think the current research suggests that uh, it's neither detrimental or protective, and short term, so. <laughs> um, and that short term use is, is okay. Now, you know, obviously it depends on if you have a family history of heart disease or, or other symptoms, um, you may not want to go on that. But, um, I, I think that the main point that I want to get across is that, um, it, you know, I, I don't like coming out and saying necessarily women are at greater risk because I, I think that it, because most dementia patients uh, and people are seen at the primary care level and 
there's not this general understanding, I think women could potentially be overdiagnosed with Alzheimer's disease by constantly putting that out into the media. And there's been a recent study uh, that came out, a neuropathological study um, of 1,000 brains um, from Florida, Mayo Jacksonville, and they had actually found that um, women were slightly overdiagnosed clinically with Alzheimer's disease and men were slightly underdiagnosed. So I would much rather take, uh, that doesn't mean that sex differences are important. And, and as we mentioned with menopause, that's critically important. We're doing a lot of work looking at hypertensive pregnancies, gestational diabetes, um, other factors. We know that uh, midlife metabolic factors are extremely important for women as well. Um, but on the other hand, we also don't know what the risk factors are for men because there have been a lot of focus on women. And so we need to also look in that direction and really understand from a personalized perspective which factors are important for women and which factors are important for men. Thank you. Um, let me turn now to Dr. Isaacson, Richard Isaacson, my good friend, is the director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, a very innovative prevention clinic, I might add, uh, here in New York at Weill Cornell. And he's also an associate professor and the assistant dean of faculty development and director of the neurology residency training program. <laughs> kind of busy uh, at New York Hospital, um, and also has a family history of, of parents with Alzheimer's disease. Um, let me just say that prevention is part of our original mission. It was, it, as, as the, the Lauder family uh, incorporated, and I, I remember see, seeing our incorporation papers for the first time when we started, there were three things that the, the lawyers put into the IRS. One was biomarkers. This was in 1998, talked about specific wow. vision. Wow. The second was prevention, that we would fund prevention. And the third was developing drugs. And of course, we've spent most of our funds on, um, on developing drugs, but we have contributed to biomarkers. But now is the time to really talk about prevention. It's one of the, I, I mentioned that things are amazing to me. One of the amazing things to me in these last 40 years is that today I think we can stand before you and say that we can prevent Alzheimer's by certain interventions that Richard's going to talk about from his clinic. And the other thing that I think Mark mentioned is that now we know that Alzheimer's starts from the brain scans. We can identify normal people in their 40s and 50s and even in their 30s that are developing amyloid, they're developing Alzheimer's. And so that there's two ways that we're looking at prevention. One is at least lifestyle and so on. And the other is that we're able to do prevention trials now and they're going on by using drugs in people that are amyloid positive to try to remove the amyloid from people who are cognitively normal and see if we can prevent the, prove the progression now, uh, of, uh, of any symptoms, prevent the onset of any symptoms whatsoever in people that are, it would be like taking someone with a little bit of heart disease that hasn't had a heart attack yet, primary prevention, and giving them lifestyle intervention and statins to prevent that first heart attack. We want to prevent the onset of clinical symptoms. Um, and lastly, I just want to say in introducing Richard that we've been collaborating with him on the Alzheimer's University program um, at, uh, at Weill Cornell, so Richard, please. Cool, thank you so much. Well, um, I don't have to say anything because Howard just covered it, thank you. <laughs> I don't need a soapbox. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that was perfect. I apologize. Um, so first off, I'm just indebted uh, to ADDF and Howard. Um, thank you for the invite. I'm also humbled to be here. Um, some just major um, people that I appreciate and I look up to in the room, so thanks so much. Um, so um, I'm an Alzheimer's prevention neurologist. So wait a minute, what, what, what did you guys just hear? So in 2013, um, at Wild Cornell Medicine and, and New York Presbyterian, uh, we started the first Alzheimer's prevention clinic in the United States. And um, back then, I would get um, tomatoes thrown at me when I would uh, stand up here and, and talk. Um, but, but I think it's OK. I think it's actually valid and correct to be using the terms Alzheimer's and prevention in the same sentence. Now, why is it OK? Well, we have some of the reasons right here and, and here. Um, we have Alzheimer's prevention clinical trials ongoing now. The first, the A4 study, I mean, re revolutionized the field. I mean, years before symptoms, Alzheimer's starts in the brain. Decades before symptoms, okay? And now we have trials that are, that are going to have results soon. Can we use a therapy years before symptoms to try to prevent or delay the onset? Um, our clinic is, is different. Um, we see patients aged 25 to 91, okay, 25 to 91. Um, I see a person with Alzheimer's, and I'll see their, f their children. I've seen a person with Alzheimer's, their two children, and their grandchild, okay? We see families. Um, believe it or not, people that are born with the ApoE4 gene have smaller brains at birth. 
Alzheimer's disease is a life course disease. Okay, when I, when I saw my Uncle Bob develop Alzheimer's disease, it was the life of the party, everything changed, right? But then when I saw another family member diagnosed seven years later, wait a minute, something's wrong with Charlotte. The doctor said she's fine. Everyone says she's fine. This is before biomarkers, but no, something was different. She didn't have memory loss symptoms, but something had changed. And this is really how we have to set up Alzheimer's prevention. We see people before symptoms. To primarily prevent a disease, we need to understand that specific person. We use biomarkers, very rudimentary now in, in, our, in our program, but we're starting to use more and more. We look at blood tests. We look at cognitive tests. So someone may not have a cognitive symptom, but we're developing tests, for example, on the cell phone. A cell phone test to, to associate faces and names together. And can that predict if there's amyloid in the brain? So if we talk about biomarkers, well, we need biomarkers, and then we need blood tests, and then maybe we need non-invasive cognitive tests on a cell phone to do widespread screening. If we're going to really beat this disease, we need to screen people in a low cost effective way. And then maybe those are the people that need the tests, right? So, so in the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Wild Cornell, um, we try anything and everything as long as it's safe. And we follow people over time. Um, on November 13th in the Journal of Alzheimer's and Dementia, we'll be kind of publishing our first um, methods paper, the instruction manual forward. And what we do is we craft a precision medicine approach. Well, what does this mean? means that Mr. Smith, well, he has these genes and these markers. He's going to need therapy A, B, and C. But Mrs. Jones, oh no. First of all, maybe there's some gender differences, different genes, different medical problems, different metabolism. Mrs. Smith is going to need therapies X, Y, and Z. So the future of Alzheimer's disease prevention, in my mind, is a precision medicine approach where each person gets a different intervention, a different set of therapies. Um, I think it's a really exciting time. Um, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without work of people who are sitting next to me on the panel. Um, we are still in its infancy. Um, you know, the book of Alzheimer's prevention, maybe the first chapter is written. Maybe we're getting through chapter two in the last five years. Um, but we're, we're getting pretty close. Um, and I think it's OK to say um, that there are things that we can do to reduce risk an effort to delay or prevent Alzheimer's. And one of the things that ADDF has been super, super helpful with, um, the field of Alzheimer's prevention is, is so new that traditional funding mechanisms, um, you know, the NIH, for example, they just don't have the types of funding for these things. Um, precision medicine and Alzheimer's prevention, like, there's no grant application that I can fill out for that. Um, but thanks to the ADDF, um, you know, what we're trying to do is um, we see patients in the clinic and we're trying to educate people online. And over the last four and a half years, we've actually educated over 1.2 million people in 56 countries through the website that Howard mentioned called um, Alzheimer's Universe or ALZU.org. Um, it's a completely free website. And instead of just putting education out there, we're trying to scientifically test or evaluate the effectiveness of online education. We have a course for the public. Um, we actually, thanks to the ADDF, have a course for doctors. Doctors need to learn how to care for a person who's at risk for Alzheimer's disease. How do you do that? Well, you have to create educational materials. So we have online courses now for the public at large, as well as for doctors. And we're studying these educational courses in two randomized, controlled trials. We're studying education like a drug. What is the optimal dose? What is the type? Should it be a video? Should it be an interactive webinar? We do pre-tests, post-tests, and in the public, we actually track cognitive function over time using online um, face name associative memory tasks. So to conclude, um, I'm, again, super appreciative. Um, we're, we're getting there. Um, you know, I have four family members with this disease. I could not be any more hopeful uh, for the field of Alzheimer's treatment or prevention than I am today. Um, so thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. So um, could you, we, we know that um, exercise, diet, don't smoke, don't drink alcohol or too much, don't be obese. If you're obese, manage your weight. So medical comorbidities, hypertension, probably a risk factor, diabetes, a risk factor. Um, you know, sort of the seven main risk factors. Um, could, could you speak to some of these, you know, particularly education? Um, I'm sorry, exercise. Education is another one, by the way, and social engagement and yes. avoiding social isolation. So I'm just 
Again, I'm talking for you. I know. Right, I'm sorry. That's no, you're hired. You're yeah. hired. <laughs> Soapbox. Here we go. But um, you know, could could you speak a little bit specifically? Like, is there what's what's the evidence? You know, and particularly maybe you can mention the finger study, for example. What's the evidence that these seven specific things that people can do in your clinic uh, would actually contribute to the prevention sure. of Alzheimer's? So over the last five and a half years, uh, we've seen over 700 people in the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic. And of these 700 people, we've recommended 56 different things. So you just listed about seven of them. Um, on average, people get anywhere between 21 to 25 different interventions that are targeted specifically for them. We look at their blood tests, their cognitive tests, et cetera. So for example, exercise. Um, exercise, by far, yeah, if you had to choose one single thing, exercise on a regular basis absolutely has the most evidence to delay, possibly prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, when it comes to exercise, though, again, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, exercise on a regular basis, probably cardiovascular exercise several times a week, as well as weight training once a week, is probably the safest bet based on the evidence, but it depends. What if a person has belly fat, visceral fat? That's the stuff around the belly that the bigger the belly, as the belly gets bigger, the memory center in the brain gets smaller. So maybe sometimes people have difficulty reducing body fat. Maybe they need to have high intensity interval training. Maybe other people may have low muscle mass. Well, then those people need to do weights twice a week. So even with exercise, there's a targeted prescription. By far and away, exercise is, 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 is the most important intervention. Um, when it comes to blood pressure control, this is, this is a just, I, I wish this, this hit the media like it should have, but in July at the, um, at the Alzheimer's meeting, something called the Sprint Mind Trial. And they followed people over time, and, and people whose blood pressure was normal in the 140s, the systolic of 140s, normal, versus optimal. So this is the concept of preventative health. What's normal may not be optimal. And when it comes to prevention, we may want optimal. So just controlling a person's blood pressure for several years from the 140s, but instead taking it down to the 120s, reduced the incidence of mild cognitive impairment by 19%. Just changing one risk factor, one risk factor reduced by 19%. So you add the exercise, social engagement, um, some people may be deficient in a nutrient. Maybe they need to eat more fish or take a supplement. Th these are all very specific targeted things where we can actually make a huge impact. And, and one day, soon, I hope, keep it up, guys, um, we're going to have that blockbuster drug. But in the, in the meantime, if someone can adopt these changes and, and delay their Alzheimer's by six months, a year, two years, or five years, well, then by lifestyle and other changes, they've prevented Alzheimer's. And then you get the drug, and then we're home free. Thank you. Well, we're, we're sort of a little late, so uh, maybe I can open it up to the audience for questions at this point. Um, Carolyn? Karen, one second, we're just going to bring you a real quick a microphone. At the recent Appel Symposium, there was a woman from MIT who was studying the 40 hertz sound and light and actually using it herself. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe in that? Do you prescribe that for people? Right, so the question is about light therapy. Um, and at the Appel Symposium, the Appel Alzheimer's Institute at Weill Cornell um, had a symposium in September. I was in clinic, unfortunately, I apologize. I'm, I'm a people doctor and clinic patients don't wait. So um, I was in clinic that day, I apologize. Um, does light therapy and light entrainment therapy have um, potential? So I guess I'll start by saying, um, number one, it's safe. Um, my motto is anything and everything as long as it's evidence-based and safe. And when it comes to light therapy and, and in training the neurons, um, it's definitely safe. Um, but what is the right dose? What is the right frequency? Does it need to be done twice a day, three times a day, five times a day? It works in mice, and that's great, but people aren't mice. So I'm not opposed to light therapy, and I absolutely definitively think the studies need to go forward. Um, but right now, I, I wouldn't say that I recommend it to my patients. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Um, Somebody in the back. Oh, in the back? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So what do you recommend to your patients whose, whose families have Alzheimer's? And, you know, my mother died from Alzheimer's, so I'm curious to know what you tell the children of these people. Sure. So I would say, first of all, um, have hope. Um, one out of three cases of Alzheimer's may be preventable if that person does everything right. 
Um, the other two out of three cases, well, maybe we can't prevent it right now, but maybe we can delay it even in the short term. I'm, I'm very transparent. I'm, I, I can't help any, everyone because some people do everything right, and because of a gene or because of a, uh, an environmental gene interaction, they're going to get Alzheimer's no matter what we do. But what I do people, tell people to do is, number one, have hope. Um, uh, number two, get educated, get informed. Know your numbers, your cholesterol, your blood sugar, your, your um, blood pressure results. Um, learn everything about, about yourself that you can. Talk to your doctor about cardiovascular risk protection. Um, and, then, and, and try to get engaged and learn. So the website that, that we've um, created with the help of ADDF is called Alzheimer's Universe. It's a free course, alzu.org. Not trying to be promotional, but um, if you want to learn about everything that is and that is not in our control, um, you can take the free course on there. And could I add one more comment to that that I think is really important is think about um, searching out and volunteering for clinical trials. There are yes. clinical trials that are being started f to identify and then tr um, put into a placebo-controlled trial for high-risk individuals. That may be high-risk because of family members. It could be high-risk because of genetics. It could be high-risk because a biomarker demonstrates that you have something has already started. And so I think it's actually really important to consider that option as well. And, and that's really important because, uh, if I may say, a, a phase three clinical trial sponsored by Lilly and Big Pharma, let's say, um, costs perhaps $400 million. That's a big risk for the company. You need two to four of those to get a drug passed. So you're talking about a billion dollar risk, maybe, maybe even Biogen probably, we think, risk $3.5 billion on their wow. phase three program. But the biggest cost today is the recruitment. It's finding yep. the patients and it's getting them the into the trials. So a right. big, maybe you could comment about, about that and how we're going to get people, because only less than 5% of people with Alzheimer's disease actually participate in trials. And it's the, depending on the trial, the, the, the rate of enrollment is maybe 10%. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important problem to identify, because I, I think it solves if we solved it, it would actually affect a lot of these things because we would, um, it, it is actually one of the biggest costs is to say, we're going to test this drug and then it takes two years to find the patients to put in the trial. So we talk about how slow research is. Some of that slowness is because of get, get, getting to um, potential patients and educating them about what are the possibilities and what are the research trials that one can gain, um, you know, can start. Um, part of it is indeed um, the, the stigma of even saying you're in, a, in an Alzheimer's research trial. That just, that just sounds like you've admitted something or your family's admitted something they don't want to talk about. And I, and I imagine you deal with this, you know, very, very seriously. And, um, but, but we have to get past that, you know. Um, and then the second one is some of the things we've talked about, which is which we have to make the biomarkers. We have to make um, it easier for families and patients to understand their own risks so that they, they know, they can look up online and say, I would be perfect for this trial. I should go call up and find out if there's anybody in my city, in my area that's, that's doing that. I, I think if we solved those two problems and, and just had a greater awareness of how to do that, I, I think Alzheimer's, that would be probably the single fastest way to accelerate Alzheimer's research is just make sure that people know about the trials and, the, and they're willing to volunteer. And, and one of the things we're excited about through the diagnostics accelerator that we're doing with yeah. the Gates Fund is um, that by having a blood test, yep. we, you know, just like cholesterol, you know, more people would be diagnosed in the community and it would create a bigger population of well-diagnosed people who would then be eligible for trials. Absolutely. Um, so, any, yes, David. Yeah. While we're waiting for uh, diagnostic tests, does it make sense now for people who have family history to do like 23andMe and then see if they have the APO4 and then from there, that would be enough for them to go to your clinic or do preventive things? So I'm, I'm glad this came up. So um, we actually have a paper last week, uh, it was published in the Journal of the Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease. Wait, take a step back. Yes, there's a Journal of the Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease. Okay, it's been out <laughs> I was for, wondering when you were going to mention yeah, that. <laughs> it's been out for four and a half years now. Okay, it's a good it's journal. Yeah. It's a great journal. Yeah. It's super helpful. So we have a paper in the Journal of the Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease last week. Berkowitz is the first author. Um, and it's the clinical application of APOE in clinical practice. So can we use genetic testing in clinical practice? And actually, Cognitive Vitality, which is the ADDF's um, prevention education arm online, um, really, I think, has the most um, found. When you Google APOE 
and prevention, their page comes up before ours. So we're, we're, we're in a little co competition there. Okay. But, um, and that, that page that was originally written now can be, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 pages. So the moral of the story is, yes, I do believe you can use the APOE4 genetic result to tailor therapeutic interventions. If you have the E4 gene, it does not mean you will definitively get Alzheimer's, not even close. If you don't have the gene, it doesn't mean you're not going to get Alzheimer's. So I don't believe in using genetic testing, specifically the E4 gene, to predict if you're going to get the disease. Honestly, if you have the E4 gene, I know what I'm up against, and I actually prefer that. I can actually um, kind of, I know, I know the approach to take. And in that paper, um, if you have the E4 gene, it says do this. If you don't have the gene, do that. So for example, um, having two copies of the gene, well maybe taking a vitamin D supplement may be preferentially beneficial for you. But in all the rest of the people, maybe vitamin D isn't protective. If you have the APOE4 gene, you better exercise three, four, five, six times a week because that can help neutralize the negative effect of that APOE4 gene. So precision medicine and targeted therapies is what I would tend to use the 23andMe type testing for. And, and just let me add, uh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. I guess, uh, you know, there, there's 23andMe and there's a whole bunch of other tests and, and I'm not sure how it works for APOE. Um, but I, I know um, I work with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia as well, and there have been a couple cases where people have come in and said, hey, I have a mutation for this, and then uh, in our clinic we end up doing a, a complete genome-wide scan and know they don't have a mutation. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, again, I'm not sure how it works for APOE, but just to have a little bit of caution there as well. You know, that's a great point, and, but people can get the APOE blood test from Quest or LabCorp or any of the traditional blood test providers. And just to elaborate, um, the, in prevention, we're constantly talking about risk and risk benefit. And so the, the risk of having one APOE4 means you're about five times more likely to get Alzheimer's than the risk of having two is maybe 15 times. And as you mentioned, just to say that, um, the way people respond, I think what you were saying is the way people respond to different therapies, and we just did a report on this, really is um, modified by and nuanced by your APOE4 status for all the things like you mentioned, not just vitamin D, but exercise and these other things. So in my practice, it, when, people, I, I, when I talk to people, I, I say, how much do you want to know about your risk? Because in, in practice, you're talking about shared values and shared decision making and the value of knowing. And some people, like myself, I don't want to know. You know, some people really want to know everything. They want to get the amyloid scan, even if they're, if they're 50, and they want to know their APOE status. Um, and maybe that'll modify their left lifestyle. And some people don't want to know. So I don't think we can make a blanket recommendation that there's no pr practice guideline that says you should get these things or you should not. I think a conversation with your doctor and understanding your own values about wanting to know your own risk is very important. David. I had a question. Um, you mentioned gender differences, but you, I didn't hear any talk about ethnic differences. Um, mm. For example, certain blood pressure drugs work better with black people and the others don't. Um, Jewish people, are, they're doing, Michael J. Fox is trying to recruit them for clinical trials for Parkinson's disease. And I was just wondering if there's similar you know, studies in the future. Sure. So, so African Americans are, are twofold uh, at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, Hispanic Americans are also at, at higher risk, a little less than twofold. Um, so there are absolutely ethnic, ethnic differences, and, and different studies are looking at different interventions in, in, different, in different groups. Um, when it comes to um, ethnic background, in terms of, for example, Ashkenazi Jews um, may have a specific Parkinson's gene. Um, my brother's a Parkinson's specialist, so he can answer those questions. He's the smart one. I'm the good-looking one. That's how this works. Uh, but I, I can't get too much into more detail, but I think the gene you're talking about is GBA. Um, so, so I think um, when we take a precision medicine approach, we should look at gender, we should look at ethnicity, we should look at all different things because, as you said, different blood pressure drugs work better in African Americans, so maybe those are the drugs that should be used, and uh, we need to map this all out. Yes? I'm just wondering, you spoke about um, dif uh, different people having um, different outward symptoms of Alzheimer's even though they had less um, evidence of tau in the brain, amyloid in mm -hmm. the tau in the brain, and others who had, you know, a ton um, had no symptoms. So what, what's really your understanding of that? It, so it, it is interesting, and it, and it suddenly is this almost a new field, and there's um, a lot of 
different groups studying it. But what it, uh, the, perhaps the, the easiest way to explain it is that um, two things might be going on. One is that we all respond a little bit differently to injury. And as Alzheimer's is a real injury to the brain, um, some people, are, their brains are much more plastic, and they actually sort of respond and try to accommodate. And, they, and you actually can reprogram areas of the brain to take over different functions. And so you end up doing pretty well. And maybe you're in that situation of your family member that you knew something had changed. But a lot of things, when you measure it, they haven't really changed. And, and so in that situation, there's a, you know, it's always a good and a bad thing. On one hand, um, it's amazing that they're doing as well, given how far the disease has progressed. Um, on the other hand, in our current world, that means it's not diagnosed, and that means it's uncertain, and you don't know. And so um, the, these new types of biomarkers could sort of bring that to light. In other situations, it may be the opposite. It could be somebody that's already had a small little stroke, and their brain actually isn't going to be able to respond as well. And actually, what that means is that the various earliest parts of the Alzheimer's starting to spread and starting to hurt the brain, then their brain actually starts showing symptoms. They, they, they may have trouble with memory, or they may have trouble with, with names and, 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 and organizing their thoughts, because their brain is struggling already before the Alzheimer's started. So those two things are really important from a research point of view because the amount of disease they have is actually quite different and, the, and what they have. And when we're 70, 80 years old, there are lots of little insults our body has tolerated. You all may know about you know, your left knee and your right hand. But the brain has, is not that different. It has also suffered little injuries. And so we have to admit that I, I think precision medicine is a fantastic thing to think about because everyone is a little different. Everyone will respond to this disease a little different. And the more we know exactly what's going on and can stage the disease accurately, I think we'll be able to pick the right treatment. In cancer, when something's more advanced, you start talking about combination therapies where you're hitting it with multiple things. I think we'll be there exactly at the same place with, um, on, um, in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, and there's, there's a concept that's evolved in research called resilience mm -hmm. and cognitive resilience. And, and so there is research being sponsored by the National Institute on Aging, for example, about what are the resilience factors that why some people yeah. have their brains filled with amyloid and they might even have some tau, but they're not showing symptoms. And one of the things about resilience is kind of how you build your brain over life, you know, uh, not just your IQ, but how many years of education. So, for example, and maybe Michelle can support this, but I think there's pretty good evidence that the number of years of education that you have in early life determines, is part of the determination of your risk of Alzheimer's disease 50 years, 60 years after you graduate college. So people who graduate, and it's not just socioeconomic, and it's a lifelong building process of your brain. So staying socially and occupationally Keeping engaged. Keeping flexible, yeah. And, right. Yeah, you know, and, and, and um, all those kinds of things. So. So the, these are resilience factors that we want to understand because there also might be therapies that we could address in terms of resilience that we could understand how to give somebody a pill to help them with their resilience. We have time for one more question, and I think it's over here. Hi. Um, so there's hope, but right now with all the research that has been part of your careers for the past, you said 40 years, um, before the medications are available, what have you found in your research that a glimmer of hope in terms of um, food and diet from different cultures that you've researched and studied all over the world, different populations? Have you seen anything or heard no. of anything that you'd share yeah. uh, in terms so, of... Uh, diet's very important. Yeah. Right. So, okay, because we, we know so. about exercise. Okay, we're all <laughs> like, I yeah. think everybody here is a member of okay. some okay. gym yeah. or something. but. Uh, What's Thank out you. there in yeah. terms of what's available now for food? Sure. I mean, in terms of diet, so there's been a lot of work, of course, with the Mediterranean diet um, for cardiovascular disease, for brain health. Um, there have been recent uh, papers out looking at Mediterranean diet and amyloid in the brain, um, suggesting that those are, that more strictly adhere to the diet have less amyloid or potentially less progression as well. Um, so that, that's certainly something that uh, is first and foremost and would suggest if, if you were asking me which diet to follow. Yeah, I agree. I think by far and away the Mediterranean style diet, and, and style 
means exercise because it's living like <laughs> the Mediterranean way. So it's the Mediterranean style diet. Um, Plant-based foods, specifically green leafy vegetables, um, may have the best benefit for the carbohydrate aspect of the diet. Then fats, um, brain healthy fats are omega-3 fatty acids, lake trout, mackerel, herring, albacore tuna, wild salmon um, specifically are high in omega-3s. Um, and then um, the protein, lean, lean poultry, um, for example, uh, white, white meat, chicken, and turkey. So, so there's different um, eating styles. Um, and I think where the field is going is it's not just about what you eat, it's, it's when you eat it. Um, so the, the next, uh, I would say, phase of brain health research will be studying intermittent fasting. Um, I don't know that humans were meant to eat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so um, eating less um, and eating in a, in a smaller time window um, is, is probably protective on the brain, but we need more research there. And then I, I have a neurologist um, who's actually a patient of mine in the prevention clinic, and he told me about the ELF diet. And I said, the ELF diet? What's the ELF diet? And he said, oh, ELF, my wife taught me. I said, oh, Ava taught you? Oh, tell What's the, eat less food. <laughs> The ELF diet, and actually this was a Mayo study um, that looked at people that had less than 2,100 calories versus um, greater than 2,100 calories a day uh, were able to cut their risk of uh, developing mild cognitive impairment by just about 50%. Okay. I'm told we have time for one more question. Um, so, okay, there it is, sorry. Hi. Yeah. No one's Hi. eating lunch, great, <laughs> my bad, I apologize. <laughs> Everything no, in moderation. No desserts, right. fried foods. Uh, could you? Could you tell us a little bit about the role of the immune system in the brain and the role of the microglia and that, uh, how this could work in Alzheimer, please? Um, yeah, it's, it's, this is, it, it, you know, I, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about the microglia and our innate immune system in the brain because... And basically we're talking about inflammation. Yeah, because what we're, what we're, thinking, of, what we're thinking is that it, at some point, um, that amyloid triggers and accelerates that tau. So we have one thing that triggers the second one, and a lot of signs are pointing to the inflammation responses in the brain. And it looks as if um, the way your brain responds, there could be a very healthy response, and you know, the, the, the protein amyloid starts building up, and the immune system, the microglia, are essentially the immune system of the brain. We talk, outside the brain, we have white blood cells that are, you hear about T cells and things like that. Inside the brain, it's a very protected environment, so the, brain, the body doesn't want a lot of inflammation in the brain because it can't tolerate it without the brain swelling up. So it has a, a very, very selective inflammation system, and that's the microglia. And the microglia go, and they can actually start chewing on uh, the amyloid plaques and actually get rid of them. In fact, some of the drugs that we're experimenting in the, in the pharmaceutical companies are how to, get, how to guide the microglia to the plaques and, and hurry that process up. And that's a very important trial right now. Um, so in one way, we're already right now testing this theory. But another aspect is that sometimes the microglia may go sort of rogue and cause an inflammation that actually accelerates the, the neurons dying back and, and losing their function and even increasing the tau. And so other, other researchers, and some of which I think um, Howard has funded um, and the ADDF, um, have gone and said, can we dampen that down? Some ways we want to increase it and other ways we have to dampen it down. And that concept is inspiring some really interesting drugs and some really interesting new avenues. And, I, and we are very, very hopeful that we could, with combination of some of these more direct, right on amyloid, right against tau, um, we might be able to stop Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so inflammation is actually the largest part of our therapeutic portfolio yep. right now. We've got several clinical trials going on of anti, novel anti-inflammatories both repurposing anti-inflammatories for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis for Alzheimer's disease, um, but also developing new drugs um, that are targeted, as you said, to either both at the same time try to dampen down the microglia at the uh, function where they're in, in releasing these inflammatory molecules that can kill brain cells, but at the same time not inhibiting their ability to yeah. uh, do the, map up, do the yeah. benefit of right. getting rid of the toxic proteins that are deposited. So it's tricky, but it's really important. Um, a really important issue. Um, and actually, we have time for another question, I'm told. <laughs> so, uh, that guy over there. Okay, uh, Stan, yes, please. It'll get you a microphone. Howard and I, <clears throat> Howard and I have discussed this in the past, but I'd love to hear what the panel has to say. I have uh, some involvement with the company Banyan Biomarkers which just got FDA approval for the ONI blood test 
for traumatic brain injury. And I'm wondering what you think the application might be for Alzheimer's or CTE. So are, um, in terms of your question, are you asking the application of that uh, biomarker for Alzheimer's and yes. CTE? Um, yeah, so I, when I talked a little bit about biomarkers, one of the things I mentioned was neurofilament light. And that's a, a nonspecific marker of neurodegeneration. And it, they have looked at it in brain injury and looked at it in vascular dementia and stroke and a variety of, of other neurodegenerative insults and find that that's elevated. And, and I'm not sure which biomarker uh, the company that you mentioned is focused on, but I think there is a role for that type of biomarker. Um, once you have, you, know, you diagnose somebody or somebody has amyloid and tau, it's really the neurodegeneration that correlates with clinical symptoms. And so if you have a marker that can follow those brain changes or brain atrophy, that's extremely beneficial in terms of determining whether a therapy might be working, determining how fast you might be progressing. And so there's certainly um, a role for that type of biomarker. And blood-based, um, of course, that's something you know, like cholesterol where you can assess it a couple times a year if you want pretty non-invasively and, and feasibly. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the panel and all of you for listening and your good questions. And we'll go to lunch now around the corner. Thank you very much.